Okay, so this would be our first session of this academic um, sessions. And the chair of the first session is Dr. Una Basu from SNB NCBS Kolkata. I request Una to please take over from here. Hi, Tadeep. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's start, or should we wait two more minutes? It's 9 28. Yes, you can start with first. Yeah, uh, so probably could check. Yes. Yes. So just to repeat uh, some crucial rules for the people who joined uh, just now. So we'll not allow uh, any questions uh, during the talks. And uh, the talk timing is, as you know, 12 plus uh, three minutes for questionings. So if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box or you can just raise your hand and then you'll uh, get your chance to ask during this uh, three minutes discussion. And uh, maybe, Professor Edna, you can start sharing. Okay. Okay. Did everyone see my slides? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. All okay, right. So, so I'm, I'm ready to start. Okay. okay. So our first speaker of this uh, first session is uh, Professor Sidney Redner from Santa Fe Institute, and he is going to talk about how uh, smart should a forager be. So Professor Redner, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And it's an honor to be part of this conference. And, uh, and I want the work I'm going to tell you about is very new. And, and it's in collaboration with my former PhD student, Uttam Bhatt, who is currently at University of California, Santa Cruz. So um, first, let me congratulate Mustansir and Deepak for their many years of interesting contributions to statistical physics. And in fact, I noticed this week that both of them independently have submitted papers to the archive. And so all I can say is keep these nice papers coming. And so these papers are from just this month in the archive. So way to go, gentlemen, I'm very impressed. And so I want to offer my best wishes for many more productive years. Okay, so um, the work I'm gonna tell you about is also uh, pretty new. It's still posted on the archive and not yet published. And uh, so here's the title, How Smart Should a Forager Be? So the idea behind this uh, project is very simple, which is imagine that you are a forager looking for food in some resource depleted environment. And if you're too stupid, well, food could be nearby, but you don't even find it. And that means that you'll die of starvation fairly easily. So if you're too stupid, your lifetime is likely to be short. On the other hand, if you're too smart for your own good, you might be able to see food that's very distant from you, but you have a large metabolic cost in, in locomotion and in, in sensing the food. And because of this high metabolic cost, it's possible that you could also not live a very long time. And so the question is, is there an optimal value of intelligence that maximizes the forager lifetime? So that's the basic goal of this talk. So, <clears throat> To try and answer this question, we, we uh, formulated what we call the intelligent starving random walk. And intelligent in quotes, because what I mean by intelligence, intelligence is actually very limited. So here is basically what the model is all about. Here is a morsel of food. This is a cabbage. And you imagine that there is some kind of a forager who's looking for food like this. So here is our forager. This is a rodent called a vole. And, um, the forager is characterized by something that we call the detection radius. So if the forager is within the detection radius of the food, he will go straight to it. But if he's outside of this detection radius, he just wanders around randomly until he comes within the detection radius of a piece of food and then goes directly to it. And the crucial element of this model is the following fact, that this detection radius is an increasing function of this so-called intelligence. So we're not thinking about the IQ or like how it, it, it socializes or anything like this. We're only correlating intelligence with the uh, detection radius. And the other thing about this forger is that this forger has some amount of metabolic reserves in its body. You can think of it as a gas tank, which is full of gasoline. And the other feature is that in addition to the uh, detection radius being an increasing function of intelligence, the metabolic burn rate is also an increasing function of this detection radius. So these two things are working against each other and that's what's going to give us a non-trivial dynamics. So here's the basis of the model. Let's imagine now we start our forager. So he's doing a random walk and as he's walking along, his metabolic reserve is slowly getting depleted. 
but this forager gets within the detection radius and then can go straight to the food and he still has some food left in his, in his body and so he hasn't starved to death. And after he eats this uh, morsel of food, he is then replenished and has a full gas tank in some sense. So this is the case of a forager that has a small detection radius. On the other hand, we could imagine a much larger forager, it's, here's an elephant, who has a much larger detection radius, but on the other hand, because he's a much bigger animal, he burns up his metabolic uh, reserves at a much quicker rate. And so in this particular case, he's again doing a random walk, his burn rate is much faster, and he runs out of metabolic energy before he gets to the food. And so this elephant turns into a dead elephant. So this is the model. So um, let's try and understand the dynamics of the model. And as a starting point, let's think about a forager without any intelligence at all. And um, so for the case of no intelligence, and let's look at one dimension, we have food morsels that are uh, distance x1, x2, x3 away from the forager. And in order for the forager to survive, he's got to get to the first morsel of food. And so the probability that the forager gets to the first morsel of food is just the first passage probability to get to a distance xn, where xn is the distance to the nth morsel of food. So this is the hitting probability to the nth morsel of food. You've got to get there within a time s, which is his starvation time, how long he can live without food before starving to death. And this is the first passage probability, and this just gives you the error function complement. Um, and from this, you can compute the time that's going to take to reach this first morsel of food if you're actually going to get there. So here's the hitting time. And then the next thing is that once we've figured out how to find the first morsel of food, we want to find the next morsel of food. And we can then compute for a given configuration of food, how long does it take or how long does he live? So for example, this forager reaches the first unit of food with a probability H1. It takes a time tau1 to get there and doesn't get to this next morsel of food. So there's a one minus H2 for not getting to the next morsel of food. And one can write a series representation for the mean time for a given configuration because you, you either eat one morsel of food, two morsels of food with two hitting probabilities and you don't get to the third guy or three hitting probabilities and three um, hitting times and so on. And then there's the last piece S which is how long you can live without food uh, before starving. And so this is the time for a given configuration of food. One then has to average over all uh, configurations of the food, so over all distances. And when you do that, uh, things with different indices, uh, the, the averages commute for same indices, they don't commute. It's kind of straightforward and just simple bookkeeping. And so you get the average time for an unintelligent forager. Now, in the case of a smart forager, one has to work a little bit harder. There's a lot more bookkeeping because sometimes you're going ballistically, sometimes you're going diffusively, but the idea behind the calculation is exactly the same. And so I'm not going to show any details. This is the only technical slide of the talk. And so let me just say that in the case of non-zero intelligence, it's the same philosophy of the calculation. It's just much more involved with more cases, more bookkeeping. That's probably not of interest to, you, to uh, us at the moment. But let me now just tell you what the results are. So the main point is that indeed there is an optimal lifetime that maximizes uh, the, I mean, uh, there's an optimal intelligence or optimal um, detection radius that, that, optim that maximizes the uh, lifetime. So on the x-axis is the detection range. And the top slide is for a 100 gram forager. The bottom slide is for a one kilogram forager where we're using biological parameters for these, for these numbers. And here L is the distance, the average distance between morsels of food, 50 meters, 25 meters, 200, 150 meters. And, when, and here the lifetime is measured in units of days. And one sees that in one dimension, uh, there is excellent agreement between the theory that I did not have not shown you because there's not enough time, but it's the same calculations for the unintelligent forager with more details. And you see that the uh, agreement between the simulation data and the theory looks pretty good. And also, I mean, you might then ask, well, like how realistic is one dimension? And it's not realistic at all. So obviously foragers live in two dimensions if they're living on planet earth or maybe a quasi three-dimensional or three-dimensional system if they're birds or fish. And so what happens in higher dimension? 
And so I'm now showing you simulation data in one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. And the other feature of these plots is there's this notion of low intelligence cost and high intelligence cost. So one basic feature in our model of how we parameterize it is that you have a basal metabolism rate plus an additional cost due to your intelligence. So the coefficient of that additional cost is what is uh, sort of demarcating these two different types of behaviors. High intelligence cost means that um, you know, you spend more on your brain compared to a low intelligence cost animal. And so the lifetime should be smaller, but nevertheless, there is a robust maximum as a function of the de detection range. So, I mean, these are our basic results that uh, we do seem to find a robust maximum uh, for this very restricted model of intelligence, where we say intelligence is directly correlated to detection range and of course, one can criticize this work because there's many other elements of, uh, that are going into this. Um, but you know, we're just thinking of a very restricted model where detection range and intelligence are directly correlated with each other. Okay, so um, I am at the end of my talk. Uh, so the question that I posed at the beginning, does there exist an optimal intelligence that maximizes forager lifetime? And the answer, I guess, is yes. And I see Mustans here has his hand up. So um, actually, maybe give me, I have 30 more seconds of, of presentation. So then you can ask your question. So anyways, yes, there exists an optimal intelligence. And then the only last thing I want to say is, again, going back to my very first slide, I've always been very impressed with the work of Mustans here and Deepak over the years, their activity, their beautiful papers. Um, and so all I want to say at the final is congratulations to both of you and my best wishes for many more years of productivity. So thank you very much. I'm thank done. you, Professor Edna, for the great talk. Yeah, um, um, I see that Musensi uh, has a question. Maybe Professor Bama, you can go on. You are muted. You're still muted. Oh, now you're not muted. No, you're muted again. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you're still muted. Okay, okay, there you are. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, Sid, thanks for the talk. Very nice. Uh, just one question. Why is the transition so sharp? I mean, uh, it looks almost like a cusp. You said a maximum, but uh, is it, uh, yes. why is it so sharp? Well, okay, so the, yes, the reason why it's so sharp, and again, it's like the details that are not shown here. In the case of a stupid forager, you get a very simple theory, but in the case of the uh, smart forager, you have to like have two different regimes, whether you are moving ballistically or, or, or um, diffusively. And so the cusp is actually the transition between diffusive and ballistic motion. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So I guess that also answers uh, Deepak and Sri Ram's questions on the chat. And then uh, Tridhi, you had the... Uh... No, I had exactly the same question. <laughs> oh, so, okay. Uh... okay. So Sri Ram, do you want, want to ask anything else or... Uh... No, no, that was my only question. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Deepak? Yeah, no, so my question has been answered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Edner once again, and then uh, we can move on to the next talk.